François Xavier, Managing Director of Faraday Club in the Benelux and your host today. Welcome back to this new episode in which we're about to introduce you to another famous VC investor from our ecosystem. Today, I'd like to welcome Thomas from Smartfin, a very talented Belgian investor who survived the Brexit. Thomas, why don't you start with telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, and how you ended up at Smartfin. Okay, nice to meet you all. Um, so I'm Thomas. I'm one of the partners at Smartfin. I, um, from a background perspective, I guess I did a, 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 an initial 10 years of a fairly traditional career in consulting. First at Accenture, where I was really more uh, doing product work, you know, uh, business analysis, but also software testing, uh, user education, etc. All the stuff around the software, but not really the coding itself. Although I did study computer sciences at some point, um, and then um, I moved on to Bain and Consulting, where I did actually learn more about the investment part and the strategy part. Obviously, working for corporates, but also a lot of large PE funds. And so I did both of that for, let's say, four or five years. Uh, and after that, I decided to join an organization that is called iMinds, uh, which is a, an organization that is linked to the university ecosystem in Flanders. Um, and that has a portfolio of 120 plus uh, tech startups. Um, and my role there was to help them in fundraising and in developing their growth strategy uh, and also managing, of course, the equity stakes that iMinds had in these companies. Um, it was a bit of an unconventional choice in a way. Some people said, are you crazy going from Bain to an unknown organization that is like, you know, uh, has a bit of a government flavor over it. But I think it was an, an excellent move. First of all, I really loved working there. Secondly, uh, it, it allowed me to actually learn the métier because I was able to observe so many companies at once in a very early phase and, and actually learn a few subtle things that I wouldn't have known if I would have started straight uh, investing after consulting uh, years. Um, it also uh, allowed me to to network in the local ecosystem with VCs because f uh, fundraising was part of the of the mission, and uh, that's how I got in touch with uh, with Jurgen. Uh, actually, when I left iMinds, the goal was to to launch a, a venture fund that then later became Smartfin Ventures. So that's actually a bit how I got into Smartfin. Uh, uh, we uh, we decided. I mean, Smartfin was already existing. It was launched by Bart Lut and, and, and Jurgen Ingels in 2014. But in 2016, the idea was to have a fund a bit more focused on earlier stage companies, and that's how I got on board to set that help set that up. Um, so that's in a nutshell. And and I'm actually based in the UK currently. Um, so I'm the only one of the team here. I think it's it's useful uh, to have a presence here. Uh, but I still spend a lot of my time in, in the, on the continent, as we say, as well, uh, traveling to the Benelux. No, very clear. Thanks for that explanation. Maybe one quick point. iMinds is now known uh, with a different name, if, uh, if I'm not wrong. Yes, yes. Uh, iMinds was uh, traditionally more focused on the software side of technology. And the, the bigger sister was iMac, uh, which had a nanotech and, and semiconductor DNA and a bit more hardware profile. And um, in 2016, I believe, or 15, end of 2015, um, it was decided to merge these organizations into one. Uh, actually, iMac absorbed, in a way, the iMac organization. Uh, so... So this is now iMac I start, in fact. Yeah, exactly, and, and exactly. Really uh, a famous and, uh, well, renowned accelerator and also investment fund uh, here in our ecosystem um, with a very good job done by the team over there. Um, so, yes, Marfin, you mentioned it. You're the only one in the UK. So Marfin is obviously a Belgium-based uh, venture capital, well-known because of uh, one of its founder, uh, and I guess maybe also because of the other ones, but everybody knows about uh, fintech entrepreneur uh, Jürgen Ingels, but we'll get back to that. So you mentioned something, early stage companies, uh, smart fin. So, so I think you quite often get the question about smart fin. Is it smart fin ventures? Is it smart fin capital? Um, so 
If I understand correctly, Smart Fin Ventures that you launched is more for early stage startups, while Capital is more for later stage uh, um, companies. Can you explain a bit more about this dis distinction and yes. uh, the way that Smart Fin is investing in both those two uh, channels and what kind of startups you're looking for? Yep, I will. Um, I think what is important for people to know is that there's one team that is working as a smart fin team, right? Uh, and we all work on all types of deals across the two stages. In the background, if you want, we have two products or two strategies. One is our venture strategy. And there we focus on companies that have a working product, some initial, initial usage or traction, ideally revenue. Uh, and, and we step on board with tickets of, let's say, one to two million. Uh, that's the first fund. Um, and obviously with the goal to help them grow into a later uh, uh, bigger series uh, or, or whatever, or expansion uh, internationally. Um, and then I would say the bread and butter historically of SmartFin Capital is the, is the growth fund, SmartFin Capital, where um, we invest in companies that have a few millions in turnover already to help them actually ex accelerate further also internationally. And often in a combination, organic growth and buy and build, it's something we, we do a lot. Um, and there uh, we invest tickets between initial tickets between five and 50 million. And then we can obviously build up uh, later down the road. Um, so in a way we look at companies from anything between let's say 100K in revenue to 50 million or even more uh, in revenue. And uh, we're happy to talk to all the entrepreneurs and then we can figure out in which bucket they fit best. I think that's the easiest way to approach it. And our venture fund is 52 million was launched in 2020. So fairly recent, it's the second generation. And the capital fund was launched end of 2019 and it's a 240 million fund. Okay. Also, also the second generation, yes. Yes, pretty impressive. Thank you for this clarification. So let's forget about ventures. Let's forget about capital. Let's only talk about Smartfin, right? Yes. So how many startups did you invest so far uh, at Smartfin? And, and how many of these were you in the lead uh, when, when proceeding with the investment? And yeah, obviously you can talk about any success stories, any returns, anything that uh, you think that might be interesting for for audience. Yeah, I think Smartfin as a whole uh, has probably done around 20 investments under the Smartfin brand. Uh, Bart and Jürgen have done other investments before Smartfin was launched as well. Very, some very successful one. Um, in this team spirit, we, we try not to pinpoint who's the lead uh, in what deal, etc. too much. Um, I think we try to collaborate as a team, uh, but I think the most known successes are obviously in recent times, the exit of new tech which was a satellite uh, technology company. They were sold to SD Engineering. Um, and uh, last year, uh, or the second half of last year, uh, obviously Unified Post IPO'd on Euronext, which was also uh, a great success story for the founder and its investors. Um, in terms of other names that you might be aware of, MariaDB is a, is a fast growing international company. Um, we have Deliverect, which is a, uh, is growing very fast uh, and it's obviously uh, in an exciting space as well. Uh, Silverfin is one of our portfolio companies. More recently, we've done uh, investments in Roemler, uh, a Dutch company that is, uh, that is offering, uh, let's say, a platform for liquid workforce, uh, mostly into FMCG retail and also uh, into telco uh, industries. Uh, but we love all our babies, uh, in all fairness. So, um, but just th those are a couple of examples. Uh, one thing to mention that I forgot to say is it's all B2B tech, right? So we are okay if there's a bit of hardware or a bit of services, but we are really focused on B2B technologies and can be SMB focused, but can also be enterprise focused. Yeah. Okay. So you won't look into any B2C proposition, any uh, B2C no. app or this kind of, uh, this kind of thing. Exactly. But it's not all about FinTech. Uh, I think- No, no, it's broader. Uh, it's it's broader. important to mention because people might think, yeah, because of the background of uh, the, the founders and the partners, it might be really focused on FinTech, but that's not the case. No, and we're actually trying, um, 
you're right. Yeah, it's 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 a perception that has been created or that that exists. It's fine. It's also because of our name to a certain extent and because of a few investment in that uh, space. We obviously understand the whole dynamic uh, of of the financial services industry quite well, but we definitely have some other examples uh, that are have nothing to do with uh, commercial service uh, financial services. For instance, uh, Akinon is a Turkish company selling e-commerce. Uh, solutions and, and platform. We have Tio Technologies, that is a video streaming technology. Uh, so there's plenty of examples that have nothing to do with financial services in our portfolio. No, super clear. Uh, and thanks for this clarification. Um, what do you think makes a SmartThings value proposition unique? Is it this kind of a uh, kind of hybrid PVC approach uh, in terms of ticket, uh, obviously uh, not in terms of uh, shareholding, uh, the sector, the geographical focus, the investment strategy. I mean, can you tell us a bit more about uh, what makes it uh, makes Smartfin so special? <laughs> uh so I think there's, there's three elements to it. Uh, one is uh, the DNA of the team. Secondly, probably uh, is a bit the structure and how it's set up uh, and of our funds. Uh, and I will not go into much technical stuff, but it's, it's also relevant. And then lastly, um, I do feel like a, a certain perspective on investing uh, is also relevant. I'll, I'll try to tackle the three very briefly. So in terms of team, we have chosen not to have a massive team. Uh, we are seven people uh, and there's a big chunk of the group that has entrepreneurial DNA. Uh, I think that's absolutely relevant, but it, it's, it makes us focus uh, so we don't have a, a spread and pray approach. We really focus uh, on the portfolio we have and we try to be involved. Um, the fact that there's entrepreneurs around the table give a good, uh, I would say, uh, dynamic and dialogue with founders yeah? because actually apart from just the strategic and the practical operational challenges of building a company there's also the more i would say soft emotional uh psychological things and and there i think it helps to have people in the room that have actually gone through it right uh so that's absolutely relevant uh and that's not just jürgen we also have bert bach the 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 founder of Trendminer, who who sold that to Software G, who's also helping in that, that respect. Um, so I think that's on the team side. So not a huge, massive team, uh, fairly small. Uh, I would say almost, uh, yeah, uh, guerrilla style <laughs> team yeah, that can move fast and, and uh, works together very closely. Um, secondly, in terms of structure, and this this is sometimes people don't even realize it. We have a mechanism that allows us to be very long-term focused. So we, we have a fairly different structure in terms of investment period and I would say harvesting period. We can actually theoretically stay on board for 18 years, which is not necessarily the plan, but it, it allows us to be patient and during difficult times and we're never forced to sell at the wrong moment. That's, that's relevant for our investors, but it's also relevant for the founders we work with. Um, a link to that, there's a there's not a, a hurdle mechanism in our in our uh, own uh, I would say incentive scheme, so so it allows to it actually drives patience, which uh, sounds a bit theoretical, but but you also see that in the behavior. I think what you see is that all companies have a phase of stress and and challenges throughout their lifetime. A lot of investors, when the stress arrives, they just add stress. We try to actually not do that. I mean. It's not always easy, but we try to do the opposite, right? When the stress comes, you should actually try to help and reduce the stress levels in the room rather than add on top. I mean, again, that's not always easy, but that's, I think, supported by, by the structure of, of the funds. And then lastly, in terms of investment strategy, you're, you're right. I mean, our venture fund is fairly traditional in the sense that we, we shoot for uh, organic growth mostly, uh, fast growth and, and, and getting companies ready for international growth. Um, but definitely with our capital fund, we, we value a lot the mix of, on the one hand, solid organic growth. Doesn't have to be 100 200% every year, but just solid growth, healthy growth where we then add on top a layer of um, M&A. Uh, and what you see is that a lot of uh, funds 
struggle with that because either they're pure hardcore venture capital funds who just want to invest in capacity to grow organically or the RPE funds that want to do M&A, but then they need cash flow because they need leverage, etc. And so we're actually doing M&A with cash burning companies. It's, it's, I would say that's a fairly unique aspect of, of our approach. And it has proven to be quite relevant and successful. I mean, unified post is probably a poster child case of, of how that strategy can be successful. Indeed. No, thanks a lot. That was brief, but super clear. Thanks. Um, yeah, I remember one, one speech back in the time uh, uh, of Jürgen. It was uh, at the after event at the Web Summit, and he was explaining the strategy of m and for growing, especially internationally. And I think because we experienced that when I was uh, active uh, in the management team of a scale-up, we experienced that problem of going international and finding the right partners. And, and I think this m and approach was a, a, a golden uh, um, yeah, tip. And I think he has many of them, especially with his uh, um, background and experience in, the, in, the, in, in, in that uh, world of uh, startups. So uh, really interesting. So Smartfin is Belgium based. We mentioned that you invest in all over Europe, yet you're based in the UK. How do you tackle this? I mean, we, especially in a period of COVID, won't be mentioning that again and again, but uh, how do you tackle this? Do you feel a bit isolated from the team, uh, from the startups that you have in your portfolio, or are you only investing in the UK? Are you active in different regions? And, and what are the difference that you uh, notice if you're active in different ecosystems? So first of all, yeah, there's a lot of questions at <laughs> once. Uh, I'll not, I, I won't zoom in too much on the COVID situation. I mean, it was tough for, for many people. I think we, we found a good way of collaborating through video calls, etc. And now traveling is picking up again. So that's, that's good. Uh, I'm able to travel to the team, <laughs> to the portfolio companies again, but also for investing. It's, it's obviously much better if you can actually interact face to face with, with management teams and founders. Uh, that being said, is it relevant for us to be present in the UK? I do think so. Um, it's uh, in the end one of the most mature ecosystems in Europe. Um, it allows to contrast and compare. Uh, if you just sit in a, in a, I would say, a smaller local region, uh, of which Belgium could be an example, and you only look at Belgian companies, then you think sometimes, oh, maybe, oh, this is exciting. This is something I haven't seen. But actually, in every country in Europe, there's probably five of them. So being here in the flow of the more international uh, deal flow, I would say, it allows you to see the trends, to contrast and compare. Uh, that's important. I also think it's absolutely uh, important for follow-on funding, right? So let's say with our venture fund, we invest in a, in a Benelux-based company, but at some point they want to um, take the go to the next level, uh, and you want to actually find follow-up funding. I think it's relevant to be to be present here and and interact with, I would say, the somewhat larger funds, uh, have some visibility. Same for exits. I mean, for some of our portfolio companies, the exit route is probably more private equity rather than IPO or trade sale. In that sense, I think, I mean, London is again an important hub. So it's definitely relevant. Um, we have, we've done one small investment in, in the past in the UK, but actually not that many. Uh, that also has a reason I would still define Smartfin as a Benelux uh, skewed uh, investment fund, right? So two thirds, if not more, are done in, in the Benelux. And that's, of course, because we have a good presence and, and reputation there. And what, it, what is actually absolutely key when you invest is that you know whether you see the good deals or not. I mean, because uh, and so I do feel like in the regions uh, beyond the Benelux, we don't see 100 percent of the deal flow. And we have to be very aware of that. So we, we are talking to a lot of good companies, a lot of good entrepreneurs, but we have to really understand um, and be selective and be, uh, be very careful that we, that we make the right choices. In the Benelux, we think we cover 80, 90% of deal flow. And so it's much easier to assess where the, the most interesting uh, companies are, are sitting and coming from. Um, but that being said, we've done an investment in Turkey. I think we're, we're about to announce an investment in Switzerland. Uh, we're looking at uh, French, Italy, I mean, uh, everywhere, pretty much the Nordics. So we're open to talk to all these uh, companies, absolutely. 
No, that that's completely true. Being able to be in the ecosystem and to understand uh, the, the dynamics of the ecosystem and see what's happening in there uh, is really key to, to get access to a quality deal flow. So completely get the point. But you in the UK, you in uh, based in London, so I guess you should see still quite some. Um, but yeah, happy to understand that. Uh, you... in, in normal times, eh? so if you ignore COVID, I think I spend more than 50% of my time in the Benelux. So I think that's relevant to know. So although I live here and I'm present here and I do have a networking and, and deal flow meetings here, uh, still a big chunk of my time goes to the Benelux as well or continental Europe. Uh, if not for deals, then it's also for the portfolio, obviously. Yeah, and uh, thanks God uh, that gives us the opportunity to reconnect from time to time physically. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Around yeah. a nice beer as Belgians we are. Uh, no, good. Uh, well, this is a bit like the annoying question. I don't know if it's annoying, but since Smartfin Capital was launched uh, by Jorgen Ingels together with other people, obviously, but um, and because of his famous name and his famous background, um, I just wanted to ask you, because I never asked you that question, but does it have a positive, less positive impact on the investment activities of Smartfin or does it influence at all your activities at Smartfin and how, if it does? Yes, I mean, it's a, it's a big plus. I mean, uh, the fact that he's known that he has a good reputation obviously helps in, in, in I would say, in attracting the right type of uh, entrepreneurs to work with us, absolutely. Um, also, certain LPs uh, find it relevant uh, because of his track record and history. Uh, but I want to add, I mean, if you want to, it's a dangerous comparison, but it's a bit like uh, Paris Saint-Germain, you know, it's a, a team of 11 players, but everybody talks about Messi. I think it's a similar dynamic. Obviously, he, he has, I mean, uh, the status he has and the track record he has, but uh, the team around him uh, is also important, uh, uh, obviously. Um, but, but it's an honor to work with him. I mean, there's nothing else I can say, right? <laughs> I can imagine, especially yeah. with his ex experience. But as you mentioned, it might be attracting the eyeballs. But on the other hand, you know, you are the, the team players uh, that, uh, that can make it happen. Uh, I think uh, investing remain uh, a team uh, yeah, job. Even though we see more and more solo VCs these days, uh, what's your take on this one? What do you think about it? Is that something that you think uh, we'll be seeing more and more? And is it interesting as an approach? Uh, as a trend and an approach, I, I, I mean, so what you don't want, and this comes back to our fairly uh, small team in the end, is, is uh, you don't want to die the, because of committees, right? I mean, people might not realize that, but there's a few steps you have to go through if you want to do an investment. And I think uh, it's good because it's, it's, you need a bit of pushback from an investment committee. We have a very in experienced investment committee within Smartfin that, that are yeah, not the management team, right? So it's external people that helps us to basically not go into deal fever and, and tunnel vision on a deal. So it's relevant, but uh, I think if structures become too big, Sometimes you have a bit too much of that and everybody wants to do a bit of a deal and then this actually creates more, uh, I don't want to call it bureaucracy, but you know, the decision process slows down. Uh, and I can see why some individuals say, okay, I just want to do deals on my own fast. I think there's also limitations to that model because in the end, uh, you need a good of uh, discussion, right? It's very tricky to think you can make all the decisions by yourself. Uh, I think that's, and then also in supporting companies after the investment, I think, uh, yeah, the, the bandwidth is limited then if you're on your own. Uh, but it will it will grow even more. Uh, I, th I do think that. Uh, so I you think from the on uh, candidate for solo VC. Uh, well, I have no ambition at w whatsoever. <laughs> no, absolutely not. But with a smart thing. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, maybe a quick one. What are, according to you, the hot sectors to invest now and why? The ones maybe to avoid too? And why? If any? Well, I think different funds have different uh, 
strategies, right? Uh, so we are uh, not obsessed with uh, extreme high risk, uh, extreme high outcome. We like to look at every case by, by itself and has to have legs, uh, which drives a certain behavior. So that has an impact on how we look at valuation, has an impact on, on how we look at a company that grows 20, 30% per year for us might be a good deal. Uh, whereas some VCs, they only want to see the hyper growth with all the consequences it brings. Um, in terms of sector, everything with data remains uh, key. Um, AI is a hot space, but okay, a lot of AI in the end comes down to data problems. So we look at that uh, a lot. I still think... Um, I mean, the big trends that have been going on for a few years, if you look at cloud, I mean, the penetration rate of cloud is definitely in the enterprise segment still fairly low. So there's still a lot of growth there to be had. Um, some people start to argue that we're ending the, gen the, the era of the, the SaaS propositions. I'm not too sure about that, to be honest. I do think that uh, definitely in the SMB, there's still a lot of space to be covered. Uh, if you look at our portfolio, some of our companies focused on SMB, uh, like Bright Analytics, for instance, I think uh, there's a lot to be done there. And you will start to see a consolidation wave uh, at some point, obviously. Um, the, the more hot areas uh, of, of high risk, high reward are probably in everything to do with, with uh, energy and, and climate uh, types of proposition. Um, we haven't really done an investment there from the fund, but we definitely have looked at a few. Um, uh, I also believe that uh, the whole crypto space is, is uh, exciting to watch. Um, Smartfin today has not done investments from the Smartfin fund, but we do collaborate with the OHA Capital to basically cover that uh, area of the market, let's say. Uh, so that's uh, some relevant and exciting stuff happening. And healthcare. I mean, uh, there's really, uh, and healthcare, when I say healthcare, uh, I do think that, that the most uh, transformational innovation will come from the merge of anything that is technology and biology. Uh, but it's not per se our sweet spot of investing, but I do think that's an exciting evolution. Well, I guess you, you're right uh, on spot with all these different sectors. I'm surprised you didn't mention one, uh, which is quite some on the news lately with, with space, space tech. What's mm -hmm. your take on that one? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, there's exciting developments. Uh, I think uh, we talk a lot about space in the team, actually. Jürgen is uh, also uh, a space uh, uh, fan, let's say, not per se from an investment perspective, but just, I mean, the whole dynamic that it creates of the next frontier, I think is exciting. Um, for our fund, uh, depends how you define space, right? New tech was satellite stuff. So, I mean, we, we in the end had some exposure to that industry. Um, the really bold stuff, uh, I think might not be the fit for us today. Uh, in terms of launching a set uh, rocket companies, etc., I don't think that's what Smartfin uh, that doesn't necessarily fit with our strategy. In all fairness, but it's exciting. So, so there's no plan yet to send the Smartfin team to 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 the moon or to the space. <laughs> no, not yet. Maybe <laughs> soon. Maybe soon. But there will be some news about uh, space. Uh, that where where Jurgen is involved soon, but I'm gonna leave that to him. To talk sure. about it. no let's uh, let's do that maybe a last one uh, before we wrap up um we've been talking about investment about uh, about you and your activities professional activities but also learn that you've got a deep passion for music so i think that's a nice way to end up this uh, this episode uh could you tell us a bit more about you know this passion are you playing instruments uh what, what what's this passion where is this passion coming from and how do you experience it Yes. Yeah. Well, um, in the meantime, obviously, I have a family with children, so there's a constraint on timing. But it's true that uh, that my big passion was always uh, playing music, uh, some guitar, some piano, mostly pop and rock bands, in all honesty. Uh, I still do that, but it's more a li living room hobby now, so no longer on stage. Um, I do think there's a few similarities with what we observe with entrepreneurs uh, in the sense that... Uh, 
you put all your effort in in a band when you write songs uh, it takes a lot of work then you get on stage uh, you do your thing and actually nobody actually <laughs> is interested in it or is waiting for it except maybe your mom and your aunt who say good job but uh, so the rejection part is very uh, similar i think you see a lot of entrepreneurs who work for months or years even to build something then they want to like get it out there and then it's a bit of a, a bummer when the the, re, the the market reacts so in that sense it's it's uh, it's uh, the, there are some similarities but for me it's mostly evolved you know to to have fun with with friends play together and uh to enjoy the music i'm also going to quite some festivals as well so that's that's cool Yeah, I, I'm sure that we already uh, uh, cross without knowing at a Werchter uh, festival, uh, this kind of thing. But if you keep um, playing maybe a bit more, maybe one day you'll be on stage. I would love to go backstage. So please uh, keep it in mind if it happens. Keep it, keep it in mind, keep pushing and uh, yeah. really happy to hear about your music uh, really soon. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, um, Thomas. It was great to have you. Uh, let's wrap it, uh, wrap it up here. Is there anything that you want to mention, additional information that we should know about Smartfin? Any spoiler on the upcoming news? Any other thing that uh, you want to mention that you forgot to mention before we wrap it up? We have uh, two investments that will be announced in the coming days. I don't know when this will actually be put live, this interview, so it might be out already. So that's going to be exciting, but I will not uh, uh, not uh, mention the companies yet. But um, for the rest, uh, thanks a lot for uh, for this interview and uh, hope uh, that we can uh, stay in touch and maybe work together on some deals. Huh? We'll definitely do. I'm sure about that. So thanks a lot, uh, Thomas, for your time today and the great insights you've provided about Smartfin, the ecosystem, yourself. I wish you uh, good luck with your current and the two upcoming investments, but many more as well. And uh, I'm looking forward to co-invest uh, together with Smartfin. So bye-bye. and Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.